This episode of The Hammer Factor is brought to you by the 2020 2020 Whitewater Journal. Pick up your Whitewater Journal at hammerfactor.com. Paddle more, remember it all. Geltman and Weld on the Hammer Factor. Take it away, boys. Dude, have you guys been following these boys who are attempting the six-man rowing raft team high-speed descent down the Grand Canyon? I just saw on Twitter that Frederick Grimers posted something about that. He was like, the rafting team is 15 minutes off the record or something. And I was like, how the fuck is the rafting team keeping up with guys in kayaks but i guess that makes more sense if it's some different record or oh it's a cool looking boat no it's the they're looking for this they're trying to do like the, the real speed, record the, yeah they're trying to do the real record and huh. they built a raft a special the guys at Hala built a special raft for them and it's got a six person rowing frame so it's like like rowing would be like collegiate rowing like, you know what i'm saying and they got a six person team and they're trying to we got to have them on the show after this. I don't. I just can't imagine how that big fat raft is going to go fast enough to do it. But can't be team beer like that. <laughs> yeah, they're going to struggle with team beer. But we should have them on the show. All right, are you guys ready to go? I don't know <gasps> if we're going to be able to get Tammy on the show today. <sighs> it's hammering snow here. Is it? Is it snowing? Oh, oh yeah. It's raining here. I think. Yeah, it's raining here. Wait, where Isn't are that you? weird? Are you guys not in the same place? We're welcome to fucking Oregon. Who knows? <laughs> it's like it's like bluebird skies fifteen minutes east of here. Probably. Why don't you snowing set, at Lewis's house? Why don't you set up it's a raining here. second mic weld in where you're at right there and have Lewis come over and that way we don't have to deal with Lewis's slow internet. I think it's you that's slow, to be honest. No. Mine like just like sporadically gets shitty. It's like it'll be totally good for a while and then it'll suck for like no identifiable reason. We have pretty solid internet here in Hood River now. All right, let's do it. I haven't heard anything. I think I should have written down my 2020 Hammer Factor paddling journal that one of my goals for the year is to make John Weld go kayaking. Has it That's happened yet? Has it happened nope. yet? Yeah, last time I was kayaking was uh, Upper Yacht, probably. I'm nine out of ten days thus far this year. Can we talk I'm about zero. can we talk about this really nine out of ten, Lewis? Mm-hmm. That's pretty righteous. I've got two days. I feel like I'm doing good. Going this weekend, Chatuga race this weekend. Unofficial go fast day on the Chatuga, I should say. So, we should probably start if we're going to start talking about this stuff and not controversial stuff that we have to edit out all right welcome to hammer factor episode 70 my name is john grace producer here in the show i'd like to introduce my co-host lewis geltman policy director for the outdoor alliance and john weld co-owner of immersion research episode 70 post christmas new year's how was the holidays fellas Sounds great. <laughs> Full of cheer at the Weld household. <laughs> it was fun. I think I'm full. Were you good. were you in Hood or were you in uh, out east? Is, is we it... flew back out east. Uh, how about you, Gelman? Uh I've been here. Yeah, we got a little rain right before Christmas. That was lovely. And then it kind of dried out for a little bit, and then started raining again around New Year's. And the last like week and a half or so, have been. Pretty nice. Like, it's been raining. It's like right? five feet of snow here this weekend. Nice. Yeah, it's turning on, man. It's sick. It's like we're getting like feet and feet and feet of snow in the mountains. It's raining low enough that there's water in the river. It's not like Richter or anything, but it's a substantial improvement from the last eight months. So, stoked. Sick. You deserve it. 
<laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> it, was, it was dry out there for a little while. For real. Well, my Christmas Eve, I was fielding con- uh, fielding phone calls from Chile. So I figure <laughs> right here at the top of the show, we need to address our rants and rave segment from last year, just to fill you or from last episode to fill you guys in. Lewis went on a little bit of a rant about uh, renting kayaks uh, down at the uh, Pucon Kayak Retreat. And I'll be honest, I really didn't think much of it. We went on past, you know, obviously. And here, let me just say this disclaimer before we go any further, is that the views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the Hammer Factor, its sponsors, or any of its supporting entities. (laughs) These are the opinions of the hosts. And our guests do not represent our sponsors or anything like that. But anyway, having said that, I get a call from Dave Hughes from Kayak Pecone, and he is livid, fully ready to sue me for libel the whole nine yards. And it took me a while to even really figure out what it was about, but it was in relation to Lewis's rant from the previous show. And when uh, I, I was I was basically asking Dave exactly what has you upset, Dave quoted some pretty strong quotes that uh, Lewis said in the last episode. (laughs) Um, I believe the humdinger was stay away from that place. It is a scam. So anyway, Dave, (laughs) Dave was not super stoked about the whole thing. Rightfully so. Um, And anyway, Dave sends us an email. The guy who, uh, who was upset. What was Tom? What's Tom's last name? Uh, Rainey. Tom Rainey. Um, basically, he said it was fine. Everything worked the way I agreed it. And he basically took Dave's defense in this saying, hey, it was a good operation. I was super stoked with my rental. I don't know what Lewis is talking about. So, you know, I, I look. Uh, Dave has a pretty detailed um, email here that he sent. And it goes into basically a lot of cool things that they're doing that down there that's outside of their kayak rental program um kind of explain the basics of it it's kind of like they have a depreciated value thing they go over it with all of this i don't know anything about the kayak rental business um but it seems tom didn't have a problem with this but lewis did uh, what say you lewis um well, I, I guess Tom is a lot more magnanimous of a character than I am. Um, I, I think Tom very much just wants to stay out of this, and uh, that's understandable. I think he probably ponied up in part to avoid being involved in a bunch of drama that I've unwelcomely dragged him back into. So I sort of regret doing that. Um, you know, I mean, frankly, I think... Uh, is a mistake for Dave to encourage this becoming an ongoing topic of conversation here. Um, I don't particularly want it to become one. And my hope is that this is the last we're going to discuss this. Uh, Dave sent us a, a slightly different accounting of the transaction at the end of the boat rental than what I relayed. And if I made any errors in my recounting of that transaction, I regret it. Um, but the bottom line that he has is the same as the bottom line that I had, which is that Tom's out 450 bucks because the boat that he was paddling broke while he was paddling it. I've been in this game for a hot minute now, and I know exactly what it looks like when a boat breaks because it's reached the end of its life. Like you get the three or four inch long crack in the chine or under the seat, which is what it looks like when the boat breaks because it's been paddled for quite a while and you've hit rocks over and over and over and over again. When a boat breaks in that situation, it was, you know, the person paddling it was not any more responsible for that break than you know, the first person to hit a rock in it, the second time that boat hit a rock, the third time that boat hit a rock, the fourth time that hit a a rock, it's just cumulative, right? And, you know, my point, which is unchanged, is if you're running a kayak, you should not be on the hook for some substantial outlay of cash because you had the misfortune of being the person paddling that boat when it reached the end of its life. And if I were renting a kayak, or if I needed a kayak, I would not sign myself up for that if I had any other options. It's an unfair arrangement in my eyes, in my opinion. And uh, 
you know, I think if you have if you have any other options or any other way to get a boat, I would not put myself on the hook for that, especially if I was planning a paddle in whitewater. And more generally, I think that when somebody is pushing a really one sided contract that uh, contains really inequitable allocation of risk, that person is telling you something about the way that they do business. And, you know, I would listen to what they're telling you. And, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to leave it there. And I, I hope I hope that this is the last we're going to have to talk about this. And I would think that Dave would probably hope the same. What's your take on this, Weld? Do you remember the segment? I sure do. Of course. Uh, I, I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't know Dave Hughes. I don't know anything about his business. Um, but I did see his reaction to, you know, to what went down. I, I mean, we've been in. We've been running IR for 25 years. Um, I mean, people say all sorts of crazy things about us, right? Uh, we have <laughs> had horrible things said about me personally and IR and the gear that we make. Uh, you know, it, 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 it comes with the business. Um, I, I mean, when we get a negative comment, like maybe Lewis said something bad about IR, we would certainly reach out to Lewis directly to try and rectify the situation. But on balance, we'd let the you know, the, the social media or whatever reviews we have and the, the general public opinion of our business speak for itself, right? Um, I mean, you can't, there's only, you just can't, every time someone says something terrible at IR, you just can't get in a protracted battle with them because it just, just gets nowhere. You have to let your business speak for itself ultimately. I mean, so, I, I would, I mean, I, I think if I was in Dave's shoes, I'd be thinking the same thing. I mean, my takeaway is I think we just need to be cognizant of the reach and the influence of the old hammer factor here. Just make sure we kind of fact check some various things. Certainly, I don't want anything bad to happen to Dave or anything like that. Um, yeah. You certainly don't want anything bad to happen to anyone in the paddle sports world. I mean, yeah, I'm ready to let it go. Check out Kai Cohen Hostel. They got a lot of cool stuff going on down there. Um Opinions are opinions, and you're going to hear a lot of them on this show. So, yeah, past that, I don't really know where to go with this. I mean, unless you guys have something you'd like to add. Sure nope. don't. All right. Moving on, we had special guest lined up this week, Tammy Ritchie from Werner Paddles. Tammy was going to come on and give us the lowdown on sort of her paddling career, building paddles at Werner, some of those challenges, whatever information she could provide on the inside, but she she didn't show up, So and we didn't get an email back, so she probably went kayaking or skiing, is what I'd imagine, hmm. um, but we'll try and have her on later, but we have a ton of listener mail coming in. We have some other topics to discuss, and of course, we have rants and raves coming up at the end of the show. So, make sure you guys have some rants. Do you have any rants and raves lined up, Lewis? <laughs> I'm, I'm sticking for raves from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So let's just kind of lead off here. This just came in, like literally just came in. This email, or this isn't an email. This was a Facebook post, Will, that, that came up. Well, this is something EJ wrote uh, on his Facebook page recently. Before we dive into this, yeah. yeah. do you guys want to do a little policy update? Oh, yeah. Do we got something? Uh, yeah, we do. All um, right. This sounds, yeah, don't, sounds don't, good. Don't, don't start sharing yet. I'm not sure if I like the sound of this. <laughs> no, are you guys? Are you, are you, are you guys gonna, sitting down? <laughs> this one's going to be extra dry. Are you guys? Are you guys familiar with the National Environmental Policy Act? Um. Now, is this the act that does a This is something that's going to get ruined, I suppose. Right? <laughs> <laughs> is this the environmental impact studies of like interstates, freeways, big projects, all that? Yeah, exactly. So NEPA, NEPA is at times referred to as the, the Magna Carta of environmental laws. Um, anytime you hear the term environmental impact statement or environmental assessment, that is something that's it's being required by NEPA. And what do you mean, what damn you, grace, Weld? What's that mean? 
I'm impressed. <laughs> I love being underestimated. I'm sorry, Lewis. Go ahead. Grace is on it, man. Seriously. Grace is a lobbyist now. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so NEPA has been in place since the 70s. It, uh, it basically requires that anytime there's a major federal action that ha- has the potential for a significant effect on the environment that there's some environmental analysis done and this, you know, how, how much environmental analysis gets done depends on, you know, the scale of the action basically. And so, you know, under NEPA, there are various levels of analysis, like the most substantial analysis would be an environmental impact statement. Relatively few of those get done every year. There's a, you know, a much larger number of environmental assessments and, you know, there's a whole set of, things that are called categorical exclusions, which means that they can avoid additional, you know, limit agencies can avoid doing additional analysis on categories of action that have already been well analyzed. And the body that oversees the implementation of NEPA, which is like pretty complex, is uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ. And CEQ just came out with new regulations uh, yesterday that are going to radically change how NEPA gets implemented across the federal government. And, you know, the goal of this is basically to speed up the NEPA decision making process, which is a, you know, a reasonable goal on its, on its surface. But the way they're setting about doing this is to, you know, really scale back the, the categories of actions that are subject to analysis under NEPA and also to scale back the analysis itself. And so, you know, this is like a 200 page rulemaking that I'm still in the process of digesting along with everyone else. But this is something that has huge potential ramifications, you know, across society, basically just trying to cut back on the amount of environmental analysis we do. You know, the, the NEPA does not date an environmentally preferable outcome. It just says that we have to engage in informed decision making. It's a really important avenue for public participation and all sorts of decision making. You know, the way that we are principally interact with it at Outdoor Alliance is in the context of things like forest planning, where you know agencies are making big decisions about the future of landscape management. And you know that process needs to be informed by sound science, by you know analyzing different alternatives, and by public process. And this has the potential for you know big deleterious effects on on all of that. The big headline change that, or the first thing that jumped out at me at least, is that they're an, eliminating a whole category of analysis called cumulative effects analysis. And you know what that means is like. There are all sorts of things where you can take, you know, a very small action that on its own will not have a significant effect on the environment, but taken together with all other similar uh, types of actions are going to have a really, really substantial impact. And like the marquee example of this is climate change, right? Like if you open a coal mine, that is not going to change the climate of the earth on its own, but taken together with all the other coal mines that are being opened, that's leading to like a global crisis. And, you know, what this change is proposing is that they're just not going to look at those cumulative impacts anymore at all, which means that basically climate change is going to be out of environmental analysis across the federal government. So this is a huge deal. It's going to be like a very protracted and technical process for us to to put together comments on this but you know if folks want to you know hit up out to reliance.org check out our you know sort of cursory introductory blog post on this get involved stay tuned we're going to have more opportunities for people to get involved with this and it's uh it's a big deal and it's going to be a big deal for a while so so what's so well, how how fast could this possibly become a reality what's the fastest possible timeline for this to actually come into place this this kind of a change so this comment period on the proposed rule runs until March 10th. I'm not sure how quickly they can turn around, you know, between the proposed rule and the uh, proposed final rule. And then who but, has to who has to adjudicate this final rule? Like who makes this who makes this the, the law the, the law of the land? CEQ does, but what's what's C- CEQ? CEQ is the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And so they so, have the, they have the sole right just to make this happen. They don't have to go to Congress or anybody else. Well. 
I mean, they have the sole right to promulgate a final rule, but you know, the chances that what they propose are is going to be illegal, like out of step with the the overwhelming majority of like NEPA case law with the requirements of the law itself. You know that the, op, the chances that that's what's going to happen here, I would I would rate as extremely high. So 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 Trump gets say, say, say Trump gets voted out of office. That's going to be the end of this, right? Hopefully, it depends. Yeah, I mean, it depends. It depends if they're able to finalize it before the end of the administration, because like like replacing a final rule basically requires the same rulemaking process, which has a lot of procedural requirements around it. It's putting the rule into place. So, you know, if the Democrats flip Congress, well, let me take that back. Depending on when they're able to finish this rulemaking, it could either be a short process to reverse this or a long process. I think there's also going to be a, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of legal challenges to whatever they do here. I can guarantee that. So, you know, what, what the ultimate fate of this exercise is. You know that's uncertain, and you know it depends on this, the election as is well. This is just another another sort of hollow effort for Trump to shore up his base and be like, "Look, I'm throwing you guys another another bone here. Look what I'm doing." I regardless of the outcome. Yeah, what's well, the motivation? I mean, it depends who you think your base is. I mean, I think the motivation is to to you know the base, like like what I think of as Trump's base is not jobs, mineral extraction, about you know, domestic energy. Right. And so it's like, you know, I think those are the entities that are driving this kind of thing. And they're the ones who are sort of benefiting from, you know, this administration's actions, not necessarily the people who might think of themselves as Trump's base. So like, you know, this is certainly going to work to the benefit of, you know, like the fossil fuel industry, mining industry, you know, things along those lines. But you know, whether you'd characterize that as Trump's base. I don't know. Hmm. But, you know, those those entities are certainly the intended beneficiary of these sort of changes. Huh. Interesting. So these rules have come out. You're trying to figure out what they are. You know, what, what categories they're trying to take out. And, uh, and then... And then move forward. And so the EPA is controlled by the executive branch. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All of the all the agencies are. Okay. Oh, interesting. Well, I it's mean, such a it's such a like like thorny technical morass. It's like like we're definitely going to try and get a law firm to help us with writing our comment. Like it's like you need real lawyers, not kayak bro lawyers for this one. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Maybe get, get get Grace involved. He could really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm ready for a career change. I'm thinking about Wait getting in. into wrestling coaching. You wanted to be a tech rep earlier today. Yeah, yeah. Are you? Is that position still on the table? Seventy five grand sprinter yes. van included. Yeah. Oh man, I'll Paper. take it. Yeah. That was the best news I had all day. Yep. I don't know. Interesting stuff. I I see this as being, you know, if you're going to run a pipeline across the national forest, just do it. Don't worry about it. You know, that kind of thing. Is that what we're, is that yeah, what we're I mean, looking at here, Lewis? Yeah, for sure. It's like, why would you want to consider what the environmental ramifications of something like that might be? Like, wouldn't we all just be happier not knowing? Gotcha. Well, just maybe we it. would. Maybe we would. Um, very good. Thank you for that. Um. I guess we can kind of switch gears here now to, uh, you know, this post from EJ on Facebook, his persona laid out on paper. Now, Weld, you added this to the board here a little bit ago. What is this and what's your take on it? EJ wrote this post on Facebook a few weeks ago, post Exodus from Jackson Kayak, his, his company, I guess. Um, very, very, uh, a lot of self-reflection going on here. Um, he didn't really outright say it, but it sure seemed to indicate that he was mulling the next move career-wise. And there was a lot of talk of paddling and his connection to paddling. Um, I'd be, I mean, this, I, we made some industry predictions based on, on stuff that, that we know. I know nothing about this, but I would... I would put money on it that EJ is thinking about starting another kayak brand. And I'd be shocked if it wasn't Whitewater. 
So a new a Jackson Cox 2.0? I'm just going to say, I don't know. Maybe. What do, you, what, I mean, what do you guys think? Did you read the post at all or did you skim through? I mean, it's very lengthy. <sighs> I did read it. Um, and I think it, you're it, right. It, it, a lot of... it, accompanied, it accompanied the post with a picture of EJ, which is not your typical EJ shirts off, you know, weight bench behind him or doing a flip off of the cliff at Rock Island or whatever he usually he does. It's just him gazing pensively off into the distance pensively off into the distance uh considering his next move so anyway what do you think i mean i can't wait i mean i love your conspiracy theory on this and i'm gonna go with it too i think you're right yeah i think there could be some way to it i mean the way this reads is that he has to have this fulfillment he needs to be you know involved he didn't feel like he was before and he's looking to do that so i don't know how else you read into that um, yeah, I mean, we did reach out. I mean, in a in a in a very offhand way for EJ to come on the show, we didn't really make any real effort. But uh, I think we should push push for that to happen here. To have yeah. EJ come on and discuss what he's thinking. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely be into that. I don't know. I mean, what do you think, Lewis? Did you read this? I haven't. I'm intrigued though. Yeah, it's on I'm the, off the Facebook. It's on. The, it ties in with our larger economic downfall of paddle sports conversation, to be sure. Which, do we want to right. get into that? I feel like we have to continue this discussion because, I mean, there's a really good... Can we get into Hipgrave's email right now? Yeah. Chris Hip, first of all, introduce Chris, Hip, Chris Hipgrave to make, to make sure people know who he is. Chris Hipgrave is in charge. He's a sales manager for Piranha USA. Right. He He's is, been in the industry forever but also. Been in the industry for a long time. Yeah. Um, Wildwater kayak racer. He's won the Russell Fork race out here a couple of times. Um, Fun fact about Chris Hipgrave, and this is going to be for only the oldest of old school paddlers. There is a very, very funny video of some British guys, and maybe some, I think they're all British, but they're running this waterfall. I think it's in Scotland or in Wales or something, and they're in Topolinos. It is, a, it is. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. Can you dig <laughs> up that video so we can put it in the show if notes? If someone out there finds this video, I would, I've seen it. I've seen it online at some point or another, so I think it's out there somewhere. But uh, it's four guys doing this drop, which really should not be kayaked. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. I'm sorry. So, Chris Hipgrave uh, of British descent. Um, it writes this email to us, and essentially, I'm going to read this email. It's kind of lengthy, but I think it's good. And well, hold on. We could, I mean, we, could, we could surmise the email in a nutshell. He, he's basically saying that that any concerns about the industry are that, that were made, that were that were promoting are misconstrued because uh, of participation. You know, participation is growing in the sport, and he has some data that he supplies and some anecdotal evidence that he supplies. I mean, that's the long and short of what he says. Um. Yes, that is what he says. But essentially he says there are – the industry is – there's more money in the industry than there ever has been. The industry is just changing. Would that be right? Would that be a good way to put it? Um, he says off by participation in Whitewater. And he, he uses the Outdoor Industry Association, ACA, Paddle Sports Report to show that whitewater participation, white, whitewater participation is growing. Um, uh, female participation is growing. Uh, 44, 44% of whitewater participants have taken whitewater skills courses, which is also a good sign for, for participation. Um, he talks about anecdotally going to the Gali and the Ock and all these things and seeing all the paddlers out there and how Piranha is pushing forward, basically, with designs to accommodate this, this new crop of paddlers. Yeah, but um, he also talks he, – he goes into some specific points about fewer manufacturers does not mean less innovation. He cites some examples there of – Yeah, and here's, here's the paragraph that gets to it. He says, turning our attention to the recent spate of industry acquisitions, mergers, and departures, again, I would argue that these are in- inevitable in a young industry like ours that only started road molding whitewater kayaks 40 years ago. Folks probably don't understand just how small – the whitewater industry is, or don't understand how small the whitewater industry is. So when big things happen, like uh, like these industry shakeups, we all probably feel somewhat threatened. However, we can choose to engage the reality that our young industry is realigning to a new re- uh, reality and adjust our own course, or we can choose to point out everything that's flawed about it and yet out of our control. I hear many folks, including the Hammer Factor, comparing whitewater kayak to the bike industry, but even, even there we are seeing mergers and acquisitions as they uh, 
grapple with the same change in retail landscape. So I think that's that's kind of what he's getting at. Okay. Do you have a response to this? Well, I think he misses the point. I, I don't argue that participation's up, um, and I don't. Under, I, 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 anecdotally, I would argue the same thing. I see tons more people, especially out east, when I go paddle than I have ever seen. But that's not the problem. The problem is, is that all of these, all of us kayakers, all of us in the United States who are kayaking right now, have been kayaking for the past 15 years, have been doing so uh, at, as the result of a very large charitable contribution from a bunch of investors and other wealthy people who've been losing money in this sport, and uh, and that's going to end. It's now, it's ending as we as we as we sit here. It's ending. Um, you know, the the return. Uh, on ki- in kayaking industry right now is zero or less less than zero, and people are fleeing. I mean, people are getting out of the business. Um, and the question is, is what is this industry going to look like at the end of this at the end of this this uh, this exodus? Right? We're not going we're going to have very few retailers left, and we're going to have very few players left. Right? Um, and that that's that's the uh, I mean that's that's the question, right? Not not participation. It's the fact that all these people paddling right now have been have been enjoying paddling in in a in a charitable situation that we have. Right. I mean, it's like if anything, that point he's making underscores yours, which is like if participation is growing and yet it's still not possible to make money, that's a bad sign. Right. Today, this week alone, we lost two we lost two retailers this week, right? Uh, One of Rocky us- Mountain Kayak. Um, out in Pennsylvania, which, to be honest, he was, you know, sorry, Jeff, you were kind of a pain in everyone's ass out there, but um, <laughs> he knows it too. And in your beloved one wheel retailer, uh, Southern Raft Supply, right, who is the largest one wheeler. If there's any, if there's any kookier model uh, in, out there in the outdoor industry than than kayaks, is one wheels. By the way, I've seen the largest of these things; they're atrocious, and so they're they're closing up shop as well. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so, right, so, who's, who's, who's going to be jumping into whitewater in the next 10 years to design whitewater boats, right? And under what circumstances are they going to do it? Uh, they're going to do it when they can actually get some kind of return on investment. Now, now granted, anybody who gets into whitewater is going to have some interest in the sport, and they're going to make some considerations of the return on investment as such. I mean, and that's kind of the reason we're in this problem right now, is a vast majority of paddle sports have been run by not so much business been worried about a return on investment but people just want who love the sport and want to contribute to it um but the only way to make money is to have a gigantic increase in boat prices and a far 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 fewer selection of kayaks and in a very questionable retail environment so and then people will you know this vacuum that occurs you know as people leave will be filled but in a very different place i think i agree fully with what hipgrave is saying here you know, I think there there's nothing. A... Dis- there's, there's nothing to disagree with. Sure, there's more people, right? But that isn't. That's not the point. These people are going to have to deal with a choice of three boats rather than twenty. We had a guy write in. Uh, what's the guy's name? Well, he didn't give his name because I, I. You're talking about Deep Throat. Yeah, Deep Throat. <laughs> um. You know, he he pointed out he pointed out among many other things that. Uh, he mentioned that Eric Jackson was a force of nature in whitewater because he produced kayaks for every phase of his paddling career, right? But he hemorrhaged cash the entire time he was doing that. You cannot make that many boats for that many people in the sport, at least not the way he was charging for them and expect that, and expect that to work, right? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I don't disagree with you there. I just think everybody thought this sport was going to go mainstream 15, 20 years, 20 years ago. It's continued to be niche. Um, everybody loaded up the liabilities on their balance sheet. Retail, I mean, there, this is the one thing and I, that I think deserves more discussion than the actual whitewater industry, although it does you know, need to be discussed. But I really think it comes to debts being called with a lot of these companies. They've kind of reached the end of the road. But the retail model is changing everywhere, everywhere. Right. From right. cars, from Tesla selling direct to wherever. And this is causing a big part of the shift. How is all of that going to settle down? How are people going to learn about the gear and get the gear? To me, I think that's what we should talk about at some point rather than the whitewater industry as a whole, because I know there's more people at the green race. I was at the golly this year. There there was too many people 
on the river. You know what I mean? It was like, we're at max capacity as far as I'm concerned. So, I don't know. Lastly, he says, let's address the Big Gear show on second thought. Let's not. That whole thing just pissed me off. Chris Hipgrave. Chris, thanks for the, the email there. Really yeah, good sure. email here. Um, I'll put this in the show notes so everybody can look at it. But, I mean, retail landscape is, is changing. I mean. So Snowy's left Dagger, right? And Dagger's moved up to Canada with Pelican, or at least their headquarters are in Pelican now, right? Who's going to be designing boats for for Dagger from here on out? Well, I think Snowy's still doing it. Do you think? I mean, I think so. You know, on a contract basis. And I love that. Have you guys heard anything more about what the Pelican acquisition portends there? Uh, mm-hmm. I dug a little nice bit, surprise. and I don't think anybody really knows quite yet. Yeah, it's a I, saw some, I saw some kids tagging Pelican in their dagger-sponsored post on uh, on the gram. It's like, huh? Speaking of tagging, just, <laughs> do that on their own or what? <laughs> Can we segue back over to da- Danny uh, Danny Seiger and, the, and his Pat Keller comment? Where was that one? I read that one. Well, once again, it was a very lengthy email, but he, Danny did, I think, make some excellent points. We, you know. To clear up, we just we were discussing last episode, Pat, and his coming out, so to speak, uh, on Instagram in regards to his feelings about politics and, and whatnot. And it's a listen, it's a, it's a controversial subject, no question about it. And there was some hand wringing amongst his sponsors as to what this means. And I still think it's a it's a worthwhile discussion to figure out, you know, how do companies negotiate this new landscape where we're we're expected to weigh in on these political decisions and and where our athletes stand on certain issues. Um, and I, the three major ones that I know, at least us, Liquid Logic and Astral, we kind of agreed to let it slide, right? Um, but I thought I think Danny disagrees with that decision. Danny disagrees, and I, he makes him, he makes he makes a point that's worth considering. I mean, what do you think, uh, Geltman? You saw this too. I'll read his email here in a second. Sorry, I lost you for ten seconds there with my crappy internet. Oh, uh, what, what do, do you I th- think? You have Danny's email. I mean, do you think he makes I, a good point? I, I agree with all of it. All right, let I me mean, let me let me let me yeah. let me di- let me dig into this here. So Danny writes, Pat Keller's Instagram post seem uh, seem like something folks have been eager to move past, but I feel this deserves further consideration. My take, I think the conclusion the brands have reached that is to, uh, that it's not the responsibility to weigh in is wrong. The consensus between the brands that well referenced seems to have been uh, reached for two reasons. One, the post sits on a certain side of a line drawn between personal and professional, and two, that you all know Pat and you think he's a good guy. I take issue with both reasonings. Uh, a sponsored whiteweather athlete's Instagram is their principal professional asset. While many such lines are blurred these days, this is one is drawn clearly and brands have drawn it themselves. Potential sponsorships are qualified by their Instagram account, uh, account and it's the metric by which their performance is measured. Brands not only draw traffic from an athlete's Instagram, but actively direct customers towards it uh, from their brand uh, URL and, make, and marketing material. In this case, a professional brand ambassador is tagging Liquid Logic directly followed by a post tagging QAnon. The athlete and Liquid Logic as a brand are giving the same exposure to the BRAP as they are to a theory that a cabal of powerful Jews and pedophiles is secretly orchestrating world events. Which, I mean, Grace, I can see you laughing. But uh, he's right. I mean, it's it's an excellent point. Our love of whitewater stems in part from the fact that it's an industry of friendships built upon collective experience. That's why it's so understandable that if you have a that your conversation about Pat tenues resolve itself with the fact that if you know Pat, you you know he's not a bad guy. And while the fact that he is a good guy might be true to your experiences with him, his defense so poor that the phrase itself has become a cliche for inadequate attempts at moral justification. I mean, that's the gist of it. Yeah, I mean, he makes a good point, right? I mean, it is like a circular relationship. It's like, you know, like Pat promotes the brand, you promote Pat. And right. it's like if he's taking some part of, portion of that equity to direct some people towards a theory that is, I mean, even calling it a theory is giving it too much credence. And it's 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 problematic, man. It really is. I'm like, I'm, It's like it's sad, you know? I think that's like it's what's hard to talk about it is it's like you don't want to like – it's like, I don't think anybody's over the moon to be seeing this happening. And it's like, I don't know. I don't, it's a difficult thing to know or say what you should do about it. But like, I, 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 I can't disagree with anything Danny says there. Right. 
yeah. you know, and the thing, the other thing, like it's been like eating at me is like, you know, at some point in that conversation in the last show, you guys, you know, like the way you guys put it was like, you were like, oh, you know, Pat's a good guy. Like if you need a rope, he's there for you. And like, what I keep coming back to in my head is like, and like, you know, this is moving beyond the conspiracy theory stuff to like, you know, the Trump stuff more broadly is like, like what about all of these people who like, who need our help, man? I mean, there are people who are fleeing like horrific violence who are being, you know, left in, in unacceptable circumstances, like just like hanging out at the border and these like giant refugee camps trying to get into the country because of what's going on here. It's like, where's the rope for those guys? You know, it's like, why is our circle of concern drawn around, you know, white middle class bros who like get themselves into trouble on the river and not broad enough to encompass people who are, you know, in really, 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 truly awful circumstances. And it's like, it's, if, if we're not there for those people, is that really being a good guy? Like, but as a kayak manufacturer, I don't want to be involved with that. I just want to make, I mean, for my wearing my hat as a kayak brand manufacturer, I just want to make kayaking gear. And support great kayakers, of which, of which Pat is certainly irrefutably one of the world's best kayakers. And to be fair, this is a whitewater show. You know, we try to keep it as close to whitewater, things related to whitewater. But that's right. the point. Is like you know, I mean, I think there's also an element. It's like it, it, it's all connected, right? <laughs> it's like, like politics is not. It's not sports. It's like you can't just like say oh, like that's that's just that's something outside of life. It's like politics is the way we interact with with these big societal questions it's like it's not politics it's society it's like our values as a society it's like it's in its big heavy difficult questions for sure you know but like have like, you guys checked out like the, the q threads and followed the story dude i did some digging <laughs> over the past few days i, I kind of like i kind of like it a little bit you know like I don't subscribe to it or believe it but it's like Game of Thrones for politics I mean it's like there's a bunch of cryptic things and then a cliffhanger I mean I'm sure it's like I'm sure it's, it's entertaining it, yeah but it's, it's like entertaining the problem that's the problem is it's like people are treating this stuff as if it's entertainment or if it's sports or if it's like your team versus my team and the reality is like this is having like you know like what's going on with our politics right now is having you know, like we're disconnected from it to a degree because we're like well off and white and like, you right, well, know, like we have the option to, we have the option to ignore this stuff and treat it like sports. And there are other people who do not have that option whose lives are being crushed by what's going on right now in world events. And like, I, I, there's, yeah, there's, yeah, but there's no doubt. But let's, about that let's, let's 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 get it back to let's get it back to to paddle sports. So what's just tell me the code of conduct for your paddle sports athletes out there in terms of social media. Like, what are we going to do here? What what are we going to say to athletes? You're a sponsored kayaker, right? And you, you know your Instagram. You have one Instagram feed, right? For your, for your, for who you are. What you know? What you, what's your rights responsibilities as a, as a sponsored athlete in regards to that? I mean, I would say you have a company. You know, it's owned by you and Kara. You guys have a set of values, and you know, I I think that you would be more than able to sponsor a set of athletes who share your values and represent the values that are important to you. you I don't really, but 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 I really don't want to know. I I don't necessarily want to know my athletes' values. I mean, I do in some sense, but in a broader sense, I don't. I I want to go back to those innocent days where I didn't have to really worry too much about that. You know. I mean, I know I, I can't. I don't blame you for wanting that. But like... I mean, I do. I don't want. We don't want. We don't want to sponsor jerks. Like, like that's been that's sort of like an understood thing with any rational person. They don't want. To, they don't want to sponsor someone who's just generally known as an as an asshole, right? Like that's we all know that. And those people are usually left out to hang, and that that works fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as far as I want to go, right? <laughs> I, I don't have to go any farther than that. That's that's fine. But so, what's the code of conduct? You're an athlete. What what are you going to tell athletes? Like, what do we write? What are the five rules? What are the five do's and don'ts of being a sponsored athlete with a social media account? Don't talk about your personal life. Is that or your your political beliefs? We don't want to know. I mean, I, I'm fine with you talking about your political beliefs if they're right. <laughs> Yeah, but that's right. But where we draw that line. If you're slightly to the right of Elizabeth Warren, you're unacceptable. Oh, God. 
there's no answers here, so we can just move on past this. But I thought Danny Danny did bring up Danny called us out on this, and I think he Danny he Foley some... was like, look, he basically called us pussies for that. So yeah, <clears throat> maybe, maybe uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm in Danny's corner. So in your your take, the these companies should distance themselves from Pat. My take is that brands and companies are composed of, of people and those people's people, I hope, have some collective mutually agreeable values and that they engage at, you know, athletes, employees, whoever, who uh, represent those values. And those, <laughs> no, those values, that's, that's I think, tough, transcend white That's water. tough because, I mean, where do you... That, I mean, that... I mean, we, I don't, I don't want a litmus test for your politics to become a become a kayak an athlete. I don't want that. Like, where do you stand on abortion? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I really don't. I mean, not in this, not in this venue. I do not care where your stand is on abortion. <laughs> I want to know if you can lay treats. And, uh, it'd be nice to fellow paddles in the river and help out the sport a little bit, right? Like I don't. I, does that make sense? It does make sense. We're moving on. Thank you for the email, Danny. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Um, I think we did answer it. We had two different opinions on what should happen here. Well, I don't have an opinion, but I think it's it's a thorny issue, and it's one that I'm interested in as a as a guy who runs a kayaking company with athletes for sure. Yeah. You look at a brand like Outdoor Retailer, they moved their location due to Utah's stance on public lands. Ostensibly. Ostensibly. Um, you know, is that you know, is that a positive? And how closely related is to what we're talking about right now to that? Yeah. I, mean, I think that's I mean I'm not I'm I'm sure that wasn't easy to I mean I know that was not a easy decision for you know, the folks at OIA to make that for any number of reasons. But I, I would say that generally speaking, that was a positive, but it also has positive, a positive effect for reasons that I would say transcend. Like there, there are very transactional, uh, reasons why that's a good idea. Right. Like, I mean, I think demonstrating that you mean business and that your, your, uh, your industry is ready to make a hard decision and sharpen its elbows and throw some punches or whatever, is uh, that has some some business benefits aside from just like acting on your values. Huh. So I'm, I just I guess I just wouldn't characterize that decision as totally like selfless. No, I see where you're going. I see I see where you're at. Um, you guys want to move on to Melissa? Melissa wants to get into slalom email. I think it's a great idea. Melissa. I think it's a good idea too. And I really think there's going to be, I have at least a half dozen people talk to me about slalom since we had our interview with Evie. And, uh, anyway, Melissa writes in Melissa Connolly. She says, all right, repeated exposure to subtle and not so sub subtle slalom information has got me curious. Say a kayaker who is comfortable in class three, but a complete beginner to slalom wants to try it out. Are there permanent, mostly permanent slalom courses set up in the preferably Western U S to practice on best resources, um, events that let people practice, even if they don't want to race. I welcome your suggestions. Love the show. Um, thanks for that email, Melissa on the East coast. I know of some places where there are some slalom courses set up, but I'm just kind of thinking of the Colorado river and the, um, Oh God, what's the river going through Durango? Um, Animus. The Animus River and whatnot. I, I can't think of any slalom courses out there. There is. So, there are not a lot of permanent slalom courses set up around the U.S. at this point, which is unfortunate. Which, which is In a terrible West, shame. Yeah. There are there are permanent gates on the Animus and Durango. Um, I think there are Flatwater gates at 32nd Street and gates at Smelter. Um, there are a lot. There were like still like a decent number of like pretty low key class two ish slalom races around the West here in the Pacific Northwest. We have the Northwest cup. Um, most of them do not are not sites that permanently have gates, but there are gates, there are permanent gates outside Portland on bull run. What's this? Um, it's sand, it, it's Sandy, whatever. Don't yeah, have it's, gates of it? it's bull run, which is like a tributary of the Sandy. Okay. Um, it's like just a little South of Troutdale. Um, 
there are, there's like a series of, of races around the Northwest. They would definitely welcome beginners. You can definitely practice on the course without racing if that's what you want to do. Um, those races are mostly in the spring, like Portland, Seattle area for the most part. There's a race down in Bend in the spring. There's a race, there's a permanent Slalom Gate site up at uh, Chilliwack in British Columbia, um, just a little oh, east of yeah, Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, I know that one. Um, I would check I out think... the, the website for the Northwest Cup. I think if you if you saw like the feeder canal in DC, which is where the US team trained for decades, it's literally I mean it's a class one. As I mean, it's you know, it's slow moving water with some eddies. But a t- I mean a ton I mean an endless an infinite amount of workouts are done there and variations and it's challenging and it's interesting and it's a good workout if you if people realize the requirements for a slalom course and how low they were you don't need a a stunning class four rapid in fact it's probably not the best place to have a good slalom training place um it'd be great to have more of these things being built i think if people like you said Gilman, go out and just try it go out and practice some practice on the slalom course and see how engaging it is it'd be great to see people building these things on their own in more yeah. locations and I would say, you know, I mean, the, the top level races, what few remain in the U.S., you know, like are not like super welcoming for beginners. But there are some slalom race series out there that are like very much targeted to people who are, you know, kind of just more getting into the sport who are or, uh, you know, those those folks who run those races would be thrilled to have new people showing up like it is you know, they need some new blood, like races like the Penn Cup series in Pennsylvania. For sure. Or some of the, like the spring races down at NSC. Like, I mean, you know, anybody can show up and uh, you know, participate and learn some stuff at those those events, like meet some people who, you know, might have a more contemporary sense of what's going on with, you know, solo battling opportunities in the US than I do. So like I, I would say just like find a local race and go. I'd agree with that. The I I can highly recommend Charlotte Whitewater Park. If you ever have a chance to get out there, there's something about taking a conveyor belt up to the top of a course that you really can uh, can argue about. But no, that's a good one. I would love to see. There's a there's a spot on the green where I'm gonna put on the lower green. There I'm gonna put up four or five gates, just single pole gates, here in the near future. Kara's been talking about putting gates on on little little white. I'm not sure where we're at with that, but at the very the at the takeout. Yeah, that'd be a good spot. Um, yeah. I'll, send me over, it, Lewis. If you have any links or Weld, if you have any links, and I'll just kind of put them together in the show notes, and maybe Melissa can go from there. Um. All right. Thanks for that. We got to give a uh, shout out to uh, the High Desert Media crew. Um, out of Bend, Oregon, lots of talent and they're young paddlers, which is awesome to see. This comes at us from Nate. So, um, Facebook page Bend Paddlers. I'll put that in the note. Are you guys familiar with the High Desert Media crew? What's that? You kind of are you, are out you there. guys familiar with the High Desert Media crew? No. Okay. Gelman, you know these cats? Uh, I don't know that name. I might know them. Their branding might might need improvement. Yeah, <laughs> we can work on that. We can work on their branding. <laughs> yeah, we'll come up with a nickname. I think we did wonders for the Tide Pod Bandits. Yeah, those guys are, those guys have blown up. Yeah. Uh, Will Underwood is worried about you, Weld. He says you need a slicey boat. You still haven't kayaked this year. That's right. Um. Well, he can I point? He got one crucial thing wrong. He says I've lost interest in the little white. That's not what I said. I lost interest in the white salmon. Okay. Very different thing. And that wasn't what section of the white salmon was that? Well, listen, you just faced it like eight months of, of paddling what I consider to be class two, three white water, and uh, it's it was frustrating. I'm not going to lie to you. It was just was not that. Was not that. <laughs> Not that engaging. <laughs> you know what? People pers- do because people do because they want to stay in shape for when the little white starts running, and I certainly blew that opportunity. You certainly did. What percentage of our listeners would you say would would cut off a toe to have year-round access to class two, three whitewater, fifteen minutes from their work? 
That is, I don't, yeah, no, you're absolutely oh, right. God, dude, yeah. <laughs> but I put, man, I put in the years, man. How many, how many years did I spend paddling class two, three, and teaching kayaking? Right. I don't know. I just need something more than that. That's the predicament. That is the predicament of a paddler who who was running class five for a big portion of their life, and as they start paddling less, what do you do? Because everything else seems boring. And guess what? You're going to face this too one day, Geltman. I hate to say it. Listen, yeah. here's you just need to let me take you yeah. under my wing, John. And you're like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the river and I'm going to rekindle your love of kayaking. You just have to trust <laughs> me that I'm not trying to kill you. <laughs> no, but it, is universally, it is universally agreed at this point that you're the very worst person to go paddling with. Dude, <laughs> unless, that is, that is a good hold to run. I hear that, that out is, here. I hear that yeah. out here, Lewis. That's nationwide. Ian, dude. Ian, Ian Van Stoutmeister, our own beloved Ian Van Stoutmeister, was at IR, and he was getting ready to run the Little Way for the first time, which happened over the weekend. And he's like, I, I just don't want to go with Lewis on my first time. <laughs> that is, that is <laughs> I'm, I'm that's un, unmerited. Yeah. All right. Sure well, can try to... Why did Ian turn into a pussy? What happened there? <laughs> Listen. Sometimes people say critical things about you, Lewis, and you just have to take it. <laughs> so that the that the the bulk of good reviews outweighs the one or two bad ones. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh God. Um, Greg Weeder writes in. He says, "I've not. He wants. Um, he has some suggestions for future topics. I have not gone back in history. He says, but three topics I'd like to hear: an in-depth analysis of dealer health and strategies to get out of contraction in whitewater." Get someone from Canucopia on as a consumer show. This is quite popular. Talk about the difference in Europe versus U.S. and how the markets thrive. Canoe Mesa versus outdoor retailer. It's not only uh, Whitewater that are in severe contraction budget and rec side as well. He puts a link here to Johnson Outdoors, largest kite manufacturer. Low-end chain really. Uh, Hemisphere Design Works are both in real trouble. So, um those are some good topics of the canoe copia one can you we should get darren bush on the show at some point i think he would have i mean he's got a very interesting show up there to say the least i mean you know i mean as far as like kayak expos that's the biggest one in the united states i mean that's the biggest kayak show in the u.s i mean canoe copia yeah i mean yeah whitewater's not a thriving part of it but you know, there's no doubt about it. But, you know, fifteen thousand people or something come through there on the weekend. Right. These consumer-facing retailer shows are an interesting creature for sure because they're not, they're not the slam dunk celebration of paddle sports that consumers may think they are. There's many manufacturers out there who really despise these things. <laughs> now, why is that? Well, you take a store like Canucopia, and this was our experience. It may be different for bigger brands who who are more important to them, but they'd say we're not going to carry your gear but you can come and bring consignment gear up to our show and sell it, right? And basically, it's, it's a, it's a no-risk proposition for them. And you have to go and buy booth space at this trade show. Um, and, and, you know, as a manufacturer, you're like, well, how about you just preseason stuff and you sell that there, that show. If you don't sell it, well, that's your problem. That's, that's, that's the risk you run as being a retailer. Um, and, and I think that the, 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 really the, you know, the, the conversion of most manufacturers to selling direct online have watered down the impact these shows have on the industry. There used to be a very famous whitewater one on the East Coast, uh, Jersey Paddler, which I think is now defunct. It was that the was same a thing. Good show. Yeah, I think of a consumer, it was probably not bad, but a lot of a lot of manufacturers were bitter at having to show up and, and parade around for these guys, these trade shows, their consumer shows. We need to get Four Corners, or we need to get a whitewater dealer on the show. I want Bobby. This. Bobby, I know you're listening. I tried. I emailed you to come on the show and discuss this because he was front, you know, front and center for the CKS incident, and he's still with CKS mm-hmm. with the new owners at Hala. Um, so, and then his third point here is talk about the differences in Europe versus USA. Um, somebody else wrote us something about that, didn't they? Didn't we have something else there? Um, well, I could say that. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about the European side of the business, except that boat manufacturers, at least, and gear manufacturers, manufacturers seem to have a better time of it in Europe. Like things seem to be going better for them. Okay, here we go. Carl... And, and Chris Hipgrave at Piranha would be example one. I mean, he's just, he's happy as a clam the way things are going right now. 
Um, Carl McCollum, he says, uh, this is the one I was talking about. Hey, I'm listening to the Code Red Freak Out all caps there about the state of kayaking in the USA with some hand wringing. But what is the health of the sport in Europe? Is it reverse D-Day style assault in our future? Is there more Zet, Letman, Piranha, Prion in our futures? Any chance of interviewing anyone from these companies? Well, we had a little um, letter there from Piranha. I don't know anything about the health of those other companies um, in Europe. But I know that, I mean, the Canoe Mesa show has been going on for a long time, and it seems to be thriving. Yeah. You know what we'll ha- we got to get on the show. Is- I mean, I would th- I would think if you're if you make boats outside of the U.S., I'd be looking at the U.S. right now. I'd be like that we need to come in and fill the vacuum, right? I mean, if 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 Waka has the capital and they're in healthy financial shape, now is the time to come in and, and and own it, right? And Piranha, I mean, Piranha right now should be should be really strategizing how they're going to capitalize this. I-, I would beg them to do this in such a way that's responsible pricing wise and not put us back and not perpetuate the nightmare that we're in, but to start charging more for boats. I know consumers are going to hate this, but we got We have to take our medicine. We'll see hmm. how that all goes. Hmm. I would like to get a, I'd like to get a tune on the show. Yeah. I'd like to see that too. Tune, by the way, is the guy who runs kayak session magazine. Who's been doing this forever. I mean, you want a trooper in the industry. That's tune. He's been promoting wetwater kayaking forever, yeah. and publishing the magazine of France. So it would and it would be great to get Tune on board to just hear his take, especially on European the European industry. I mean, he's sitting right there in you know in the middle of it. All right, where else are we at here? Are there any of these listener mails that you feel like need to be brought to the top? This deep throat one. Um, we kind of covered the the. We did the QAnon thing. And we're kind of th- we're kind of we're kind of through our list of, of listener mails here. We don't have our special guest, so I guess I'll make a request here that if you're a if you're a retailer, we'd love to have you on the show. Send us a message. Right. A lot of questions. Yeah. How how are we gonna make this work? Yeah, we'd love to we'd love to get you on the show. Um, Lewis is nine days into his whitewater journal. That's impressive. Where are you going kayaking every day? All on the little, little white? white. Uh, yeah, trust the little white. How far is it a drive to the takeout from your house? Here we go. Like 15 minutes. So it's kind of a haul. It's kind of a haul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you guys have anything else you'd like to add before we get into our rants and raves? Well, some guy mentioned Steve Fisher in the Dreamline <laughs> again. What was where was this one at? I don't see this in our list. The very bottom of the the queue there. Okay, um, Johnny Foster writes in. Um, and Grace, yeah, Grace, you you are the you are the the hub of this wheel, man. You're the one who could unlock the Dreamline mystery. I cannot unlock the Dreamline mystery. I have tried. To unlock this is what it. you say when we're in the show, but we talk privately. There's a lot of information that we're sitting on. <laughs> are... I hate to call you out on this, but you know this is true. I know this is true. Oh, you are so deep state. <laughs> um... Dreamline. Dreamline Ninja killed Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, Johnny Foster says, since you all addressed the controversy around Pat Keller's QAnon conspiracy theories, how about addressing what you know about the Dreamline Steve Fisher controversy, or Thank better you. yet, have Pat Keller on to talk about it since he was tangibly involved. Then we could hear about the conspiracy theories around the disappearance of Steve <clears throat> Fisher. It would be awesome. Hammer Factor Nation would love it. I could not agree more. Well, he's not going to come on, but we. I, I still think there's some unanswered questions here. I, th- I think Mr. Foster is, is exactly right, my opinion. Well, I don't know what to say about it. In the regards of the, all of the, the Kickstarter, all the clinics and everything were fulfilled. There was a DVD that was never delivered. So I don't know when the release date of that DVD is. Okay. Uh, Chinese, <laughs> Chinese democracy kind of movies. Ah, oh, Jesus. See, this is what you guys don't get. Every time that you dig into this and Lewis is like, oh, it's a fucking scam. And, blah, 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 and you're like this and that. And, oh, no, we live right up the road. You know who gets the freaking phone calls? Yeah. You know who gets the emails? You know, you're sitting there in your pizza parlor weld and you're out running the little white Lewis. And I'm sitting here on Christmas Eve getting shit in my ear for some shit. I don't even know what's said. I don't even remember it. 
<laughs> God. Sorry for dragging you into that, Grace. I am taking <laughs> applications for co-hosts. Send me a resume, <laughs> and we will get you on the show ASAP. All right, everybody, let's move into our favorite part of the show here. <laughs> you know, our used to be favorite part of the show. Now the thorn in my side. Rants and raves. This is where Lewis rants, and I, and I deal with it a day later. Um, somebody start us off here. I'm, I'm, I'm ill-prepared. I'm going to rave about a, a nice, warm glass of milk. It really calms <laughs> you down when you're feeling riled up. Oh, man. It's just a spot. Maybe a piece of dry toast on the side just to <laughs> thing together. <laughs> <laughs> all right so warm milk for lewis that's a good one <laughs> hopefully we don't have a bunch of lactose intolerant listeners out there um how about you weld what do you got i'm gonna rave about just taking long walks on a beach with a loved one <laughs> and maybe going back to the airbnb to watch like a, a rom-con of some sort <laughs> The special moments like that. Yeah. Where you can just connect with a loved one. I'm going to rave about, you know, evenings watching Netflix with my dog on the sofa. <laughs> just all alone? Just how nice <laughs> it is to be, here, be there with a warm fire going. <laughs> so I, I think that covers it for this show. All right. Thank you for listening. We will be back to full force uh, next episode. Um, apologies to everybody offended along the way, and we'll see you on the river. <laughs>